We've got a great text for us today, and um, I hope that as we look at this today that we will all be encouraged, that we'll be enlightened, that we'll be challenged uh, to be salt and light. Actually, that song that we just sang, Send the Light, someone uh, in Sydney once said, well, we'll just change the words. Instead of saying, send the light, it will be, be the light. So I want you to, when you, when you sing that song next time, just put the word be there instead of send. Uh, and that changes the whole meaning of that. So that's what we want to talk about today, being the light. So let's have, have a look at our text. Our text over here is in Matthew chapter 5, verses uh, 13 to 16, a very simple text. But it says, you are the salt of the earth, and if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? You are the light of the world. Uh, a, a, a city or a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and stick it under a bowl or stick it under a bushel or stick it under a basket, depending on the song that you sang when you were a youngster, you know. Um, but they, instead they put it on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. And then he says there, let your light shine in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Wonderful passage, a very simple text, very easy, four verses here. And if I, th I think if I could sum this whole passage down to one word, it would be this word here, yeah, influence. You know, this whole passage is about how we influence the world. And Jesus is saying that you as a Christian, you have to influence the world and you have to be the salt. And we are to influence the world as light. And if all of uh, this really sums up all a person is. Now, the amazing thing of here is, this comes just straight off to the Beatitudes. And we got a good introduction to some of that last night. But when you have a look at the, the last Beatitude, there, because the Beatitudes really is really talking about our Christian character, isn't it? It's talking about who you are, how you are in the world. And so this is your character. This is how, who you are to, to be. This is our, our Christian character. But the last verse, there, or the last Beatitude in verse 10 says, Blessed are you when, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Verse 11 says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And he carries on and says, Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. You know, in other words, we're in this world, and in the world they are going to hate us. Now they're going to persecute us. They're going to insult us. They're going to hate us. And we can expect that to happen. And we have to get ready for that. And be prepared for that because we are living in a very dark world and with social media and the things that are going on. Uh, I don't know what it's like over here. I know in Sydney, if you're a Christian and you put anything up on Facebook or anything like that, people just slam you. Um, the, the, the world is mocking us. The world is insulting us. And so, and you know what? It's not going to get any easier. It's going to get harder and harder as that rhetoric gets worse and worse because we're living in the darkness. And God wants us I believe God wants us to confront the world. He wants us to, the world is going to be there. It's going to persecute us. It's going to insult us. It's going to say all kinds of evil against us. But the worst thing that can be is if we crawl into a hole and hide away. And he doesn't want us to do that. He doesn't want you to crawl in the wall. Instead, it says in verse 13, you are the salt. You are the light. So be the salt. Be the light. Um, now, we want to break this lesson up into Four different ways, four different things here. And I, will, I will go through these quickly, so don't worry, this is not going to be a long lesson. Um, first of all, we're going to have a look at the presupposition. Now, that's a big word. I said that, I used that word in, in, in Australia with all my Chinese students, and they looked at me like, oh, well, well, what's, what? <laughs> Let me get my dictionary out here. What's presupposition? I'll explain that to you. It's a, it's a big word, but it's not. The text presupposes something. So we're going to look at the presupposition that Jesus talks about here. Then we'll have a look at the plan. There's a plan. He, God has a plan. Jesus has a plan. Then we'll see the problem. And lastly, we'll see the purpose. So the presupposition in the text here, presupposition is the, the darkness and the decay. There is darkness. Our world is a decaying world. It is a world that is just being rotting away. Uh, it's a, the presupposition there is there is darkness. And where, there, where, there's, where there's decay, you need salt. You need salt to stop the decay. The presupposition is there is darkness, and because the darkness is there, you need light. That's the, te the text just pre presupposes that. Jesus tells us that over here. We're living in a very dark world. 
And we've got to be different, and we've got to affect the world. Uh, and unless we're different, unless our families are different, unless our lives are different, unless we've got that character that's talking about there in the Beatitudes, unless we're having that, that kind of character, there's no ways we're going to influence the world. And so that's what he's, he's talking about here. So he's saying, um, we've got to be different. God, you know, you read through Genesis, and God saw that, the, you read in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, and there's sin. By the time you get to Genesis chapter 6, God looks at the world, and his heart is broken, because he saw that the evil and the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was continually evil all the time. You know, that's Genesis chapter 6. That's so early in the story. You carry on reading in your Bible, by the time you get to Genesis 19, God looks at it over there and says, these people are so wicked, these people are so evil, and he goes and destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. This, it's been darkness all the time. It's, it's, it's a bit worse now, in that social media and the television and things, it's there, it's more in our face, but that darkness has been there all the time. The, the decay has been there all the time. And we live in a dark and decaying world. Now, I'm not going to talk about this too much, about the darkness. You know the darkness. You know your darkness over here. You know the decay in, 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 uh, in the States. Um, I, I, was growing, I grew up in South Africa. Do yourself a little favor and just type in on your Google search. You can do it on your phone or on your computer. Just type in the crime statistics in South Africa. It'll blow your mind away. A woman is raped every 17 seconds in South Africa. That's just terrible. You know, um, horrific crimes. I come from Sydney. Uh, last week, just before I came here, my wife and I were going to go and buy some souvenirs down in Chinatown and the, 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 the Paddy's Markets and things. We were going to go down there, and uh, uh, my mother-in-law said, I don't think today is a good day to go. I said, why is that? She said, well, it's the gay and lesbian Mardi Gras today. And millions and millions of people come to Sydney, Australia, and these men and women parade half naked down the streets in all their clothes and doing their things and it's a big celebration and our whole city is just rejoicing because wow look at all the revenue it brings into our country and if you say anything negative about it they'll shoot you down we live in a dark decaying world and sin is there you know what it's like i'm not going to talk about that too much you know your world over here but let's look at this what's the plan what is Jesus' plan for this? And the plan for us is the influence of his disciples. And not only do I want to use this word influence, I want to use this word as the word, the, do, the dominion or domination of um, the disciples in the world. I love this, this passage in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, But you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare his praises uh, of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. We are the priests of God. We are his people. We are the ones who are going to affect the world. We are the ones who are going to make a change in the world. And so we have to influence the world. That's what it says there in verse 13. It says, you are the light. I mean, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt. Then verse 14, you are the light of the world. Verse 16, let your light shine before others. What is God's plan to deal with the darkness? What is God's plan to deal with the decaying, sin-sick world? His plan is us. His plan is you and I. That's it. There isn't any other plan. What is God's plan to deal with the decay? It's us. We're it. Now, we're the Lord's church. You are the salt. You are the light. And if we don't do it, well, there's nobody else. No one else is going to do that. We are the salt. We are the Lord's church. We are his kings. We are his priests living in the world. Now, look at the, I want to look at some of these symbols over here. Uh, one of the symbols, of, the first symbol that he speaks about is salt. Wonderful, it's easy. I'm sure you've heard many, many lessons about the salt uh, and things like this. Salt is a, is a unique thing. It's very much unlike the medium in which it is placed. Okay, you've got a salt cellar or a salt shaker or a salt grinder. Well, that thing might look very nice on the outside, but the salt on the inside is very different to that. The same with light. Light is very much unlike the darkness. And God has changed us 
This is the amazing thing about us being Christians. God has changed us from being that corruption into the salt that prevents the corruption. God has changed us from the gloomy darkness to being the light that shines in the world. That's an amazing thing. That's what takes place when we become Christians. Um, and I don't think there's any middle ground. There is no middle ground. So what does it mean to be salt? How does salt manifest itself in the world? Uh, if you don't know this, um, salt was actually very, very valuable. It was very valuable in human society. Salt was very important. In fact, the Romans said that there's only two very valuable things, salt and the sun. There's nothing more valuable than the salt and the sun. Um, and especially in a world without refrigeration, salt was very, very valuable. You needed salt. Um, that's the only way that they could preserve their meat. Uh, they'd literally rub it into their meat. Now, I come from South Africa. We call that dried meat with a, where they rub it in there. They, we call it biltong. Over here, you call it jerky. Um, but that's all it is, you know. They rub that, that meat with the salt. They hang it up in a, in a butcher shop for a while, and you come by there and you slice it up, and it, and it tastes wonderful. But that's, that's what, it's, what it's used for. Um, back in the old days when they had their ships and they'd be traveling for months at sea, you know, they could slaughter a lamb or a goat on the, on the ship, but oftentimes they would slaughter those animals. They'd have these big barrels full of brine or salt water, and they'd just leave the meat in those, in those barrels. And they could use that, that, um, that meat for a long time. But did you know this? This is something very interesting. I only found this out um, a little while ago. Roman soldiers were actually paid in salt. Did you know that? They were paid in salt. So if you were a lousy soldier, you weren't worth your salt. That's where that phrase comes from. You weren't worth your salt. Um, our word salary, when we get paid our salary, comes from salt. You know, it comes from, that's the, that's the, the meaning, this is where, where it all comes from here. Uh, and it's, it was a very important commodity. And Jesus saying, hey, you are the salt of the earth. Now, when he said that, I'm sure they, they had a whole lot of things. There's a whole lot of things that could have been going through their mind. Hey, yeah, we're, we're very valuable. We're like sun. You know, we're like the salt. It's, it's very valuable. Uh, a few things about salt. Um, salt was used as a, well, think about those white crystals. It's something that's pure. It's something wonderful. It purifies. Um, salt brings flavor. I love, I love your bacon over here. It's fantastic. It's, it's salty. It's smoked. It's got flavor. We had that wonderful breakfast this morning, Sheila. It was wonderful. You know, that salty bacon. Uh, but, you know, have you ever had an egg just by itself? Kind of a bit bland. You, know, you need some salt on there to, to give flavor to things. And so it's pure. It's, it's flavor. Um, but it also stings. It stings in the wound. Ever, ever cut yourself and you grab some salt on there? Um, well, I, I brought something along. Aha. You see in this product? Fess. You know what fess is? Salt water, saline solution. <sighs> yeah? Clears out, the, clears out your nose. This is fantastic stuff. I wake up in the morning, my nose is all blocked. I squirt that up there uh, and I can breathe for the day. Um, that's, that's a saline solution. That's all it is. Um, Salt, it stings. That's what salt does. It, it stings, it burns away, it cleanses. But I think one of the, the, one of the greatest characteristics of salt is that it's a preservative. And that's what salt does. Okay? It preserves things. Um, and that's what we're called to do. We're called to be, well, we're called to be people who flavor the world. We are to have a flavor. We have to have an, uh, an influence. And you kind of think about salt. When, we, when, we, when you sprinkle salt, you don't just take, well, one little grain of salt and put it on the food there. You kind of sprinkle a bit on there. But when salt is doing its work, it's, it's, it's mingled into the food. It's, uh, it dissolves in there. You don't actually see it working. It's that influence. And that's the influence that we have in the world, that we're influencing it. We're flavoring the world. We're, we're sting. We're there to sting. To, to take to deal with sin in the world, but ultimately we're there to preserve it. Um, now, when you think about this, it's kind of a it's a negative aspect that he's talking about here. Salt, it's it's negative. It's not a it's not a positive thing. It's you know we're going to there we're going to um, preserve it. We're going to work in that. We're going to flavor it. Uh, we're going to deal with the the apostasy. We're going to deal with um, the sting of sin just by our presence in the world. 
And that's, so that's a negative thing. The other side of, of this illustration is the light. And the light is a very positive sense in a, in a sense. Uh, and because Jesus says here, you are the light of the world. And so well, let's deal with this analogy that he gives us here. As we move into the salt, kind of, the, the two balance each other out. Now, on the one hand, you live it. It's your character. It's your influence in the world. But on the other hand, it's what we preach. It's the message. It's, it's the life and the message. These two go together. Kent, I think of your lesson of the M&M, you know, the message and the ministry. That's exactly the, the same thing here. And that's about salt. Salt is hidden. You don't see it. It just melts into there. But we preach it and by our lives, by the character of our lives, by the message of our lives. Um, and it's by our conduct in the world. Verse 16 says, um, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, this implies, first of all, that they actually see our good works. So that's our influence. That's our character. They've got to see that. And they are not going to glorify God in heaven unless they see that in our lives. They're not going to see that. They're not going to be able to do that if they don't see God in our lives. And so this is the, what this, this text is implying here. Remember what it says in Acts chapter um, 1 verse 1? Luke writes there, it says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. All that he began to do and teach. Those two things go together. It's the living and the speaking. It's, uh, it's our manner of life, living a righteous life and uttering our righteous content of the truth. Uh, light is, is related to our knowledge of God. For example, I'll give you a few examples from the scriptures here about the light. Uh, first of all, 1 John 1 and verse 5 says, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And so if we are to be light, we are to manifest God. We're going to show God to the world. Psalm 119 verse 105. We know that one. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Okay, we know that one. God, God is light. The word is light. And then Jesus in the New Testament says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so we see here that God is light. The Bible or God's word is light and Jesus is the light. And that's the light that's going to shine on the world in God's word. And we've got to keep telling that. And we tell people, we tell people about God and we tell people about God's word and we tell people about God's word, the son, Jesus. And that is, that's this message that we, we want to speak and we've got to be consistent with that. Luke 1 verse 77 is another wonderful passage. Um, it gives us the purpose for which Christ came. And this is what it says there. It says, to give these people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet to the path of peace. That's why he came. That's why Jesus came. He came to, to be light to give light in a dark world. He came as that light. And so our Lord is saying to us here, um, collectively, as a group, as a body of God's people, be the light. Shine that light. Shine that message. Be the salt, but be the light. Just let that light shine in the world. And Jesus illustrates this right here in Matthew 5, and he gives us um, a very visible picture here. And he says here, we can't, and he's not, this is not talking about some kind of secret influence and the picture he says a city on a hill cannot be hidden you know you can't hide it you can't hide that it's there it's on a hill I, i've been to israel went there in 1988 long time ago spent 11 months in israel had a wonderful time walking around traveling there living on kibbutzes and moshavs and working and traveling around but it, this is very true any little city or any little village on a hill if you're walking at night in a place of refuge, you could always find it. You can always see it. Why? Because the light is shining. And you, and you can see this even out here on the prairie. You know, it'd be miles away, but you can still see that, that light shining there, especially if it's on a hill. Um, 
this is what he's, he, the picture that he's giving to us here. You're the light, and the light is not supposed to be hidden. You're a city on a hill. It's something that's to be clearly visible. Salt is subtle. Our character, our influence in the world is kind of subtle. People don't always see that. But this message of Jesus that we want to shine out, that's something that we be bold and it cannot be, cannot be hidden. Um, now, let's have a look at it. We've seen so far, well, we've seen the presupposition. The presupposition is the darkness and the decay. The decay is there. The darkness is there. And that's why we need salt. And that's why we need light. Um, the plan, well, the plan is us. The plan is the influence the domination, dominion, I could say, of us disciples in the world and the way that we, we do this. But there is a problem. And the problem, well, the problem is the danger of failure. And this is, again, just in the text here. The problem is the danger of failure. That's the danger. We are salt and we are light, but we need to be warned here. Because we can live our lives, even as Christians, and we can sin and sin and sin. And if we never repent of that sin, and we never deal with that sin, well, we lose our influence, don't we? We lose that influence. Um, and we can't share that message because that message has no value when you've got no influence because of living a life of sin. And so that's the problem. There's the, there's the problem here. Um, the danger of failure. Look at verse 13 again. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. And it says, neither do people light a lamp and, and put it under a bowl. That's the problem. You know, you don't put it under a bowl. Instead, um, salt is to, it's only good when it's, uh, when it's out there influencing. Light is only good when it's visible. If it's not out, standing up there, then no one can see it. And so let's look at this, this concept of salt first, and then we'll deal with the light. Jesus says there's a danger here that salt can lose its saltiness. And you might think, well, does it really? The salt today doesn't really lose its saltiness. I mean, I've had salt in my salt shaker. It's been there for like 10 years. We're still using it. And we bought the big one and just keeps it. And it's, it's still good. Jesus says, well, salt can lose its saltiness. How does it lose its saltiness? Well, it can lose its saltiness, uh, especially in those days, you know, the salt and the salt there by the Dead Sea. I mean, it's amazing. They can harvest that there. I've swam in the Dead Sea, just kind of like bob along in the, in the water there. They harvest that salt. But oftentimes, if they just left it on the ground, some of it could leach into the soil. Um, I think another way that salt can lose its saltiness, especially back in those days when they had tax collectors, maybe you've got your bag of salt and you're going to the markets and Maybe Matthew, the tax collector, stops you along the way and says, hey, pay the, pay the salt tax. Um, and you have to pay 10% salt tax. So you scoop out, and you've got a big bag, and you scoop out 10% of that, and you pay that tax. Well, now I've got less salt. So I'll just put a bit of sand or some other stuff in there. I still want to have a 10-kilogram bag or 10-pound bag of salt. Um, and then you go along, and you meet another tax collector, and he says, hey, pay the salt tax. Pay, I want 10%. So you scoop out another 10%. And guess what happens? You do that a few times, you've got salt with, mixed with a whole lot of other stuff. And it's, it's, it's lost its saltiness. And guess what? It's no longer good for anything. You can't throw it on your garden. It's going to kill your plants. So the only thing you can do is throw it out on the road where people are going to walk on it and get trampled underfoot by men. And so um, salt can lose its saltiness. It had a capacity to lose its saltiness. Um, and that's something that we, we need to understand. And if a, if a Christian's um, life loses their influence because of sin, because of whatever, you know, then, we, then we have no influence in the world um, and we can't stop the corruption. We can't stop the decay when there's that sin there. And so the point here is, is not that we're going to lose our salvation as such, but you can forfeit your influence um, and you can lose your impact. A Christian who loses his saltiness is in a sad situation and you can lose it. Um, you can lose it just by, just by listening to the dirty talk and going along with the flow. You can lose it by being involved in things that you know aren't right. Uh, and you, whether it's at work or university or wherever you are, you, you hear it. It's just going along with those things on social media that you, 
And yes, people even click like to stuff that they think, why are you actually clicking like to this? Why are you even showing that? But we lose our influence, and that can actually happen. Now, let's talk about the light for a moment here. Um, he says light, light is something that's to be set on a hill. You don't put it on a lamp. Or you put it on a lampstand so they can give light to everyone in the house. And certainly light, um, I don't know if you've ever seen any pictures of those um, little lamps that they had. So it was just a little a terracotta bowl. Uh, they had some oil in there and they had a little floating wick. Uh, and that's light. In order for that to work, you want to put it up high. In the house, so that, that it can give light to everyone in the house. In fact, uh, Proverbs 31, you know that beautiful proverb, the proverbial woman. Uh, she's a lady who gets up in the middle of the night and she she um, she trims that that lamp and she keeps that light shining. I imagine that you get up in the middle of the night. She wants to do that to keep that light going, so that people wake up in the middle of the night and they don't know where they are. That light is shining. And it's there and it's on a lampstand so it can give light to everyone in the house. And Jesus is saying, how foolish it would be to have a lamp and to get it trimmed and then hide it under a bowl or a basket. We used to say hide it under a bushel. I never knew what a bushel was when I was a kid. Um, I, I relate to a bowl or a basket. You know? I, um, but it, if you, you've got to have this thing standing out. No one would do that. That would be silly. To have a light and then stick a bowl over it. Can't do anything. And Christians, you know what, is, uh, what, what I find is amazing? Is we have this treasure of, in, in earthen vessels. We've got the gospel of Jesus Christ. And nobody knows about it. Isn't that sad? That's sad all over the world. I'm from South Africa. I'm in Australia. Now, I know people, we all, I'm sure the people are people, the people are the same everywhere. We've got the gospel, we've got the message of salvation. And when last did you tell anyone about that? I know people haven't told to anyone, talked to anyone about Jesus for a year. Five years, ten years. You know? People, we've got this amazing message. And they're not sharing that. They're not, they, they've got this light. And we've hidden it under a bowl. And I find it's kind of interesting. He says there in verse 15, Neither do men light a lamp and put it on a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Um, and it's always, as the text says in, in that be at last beatitude, it's always the fear of persecution that makes us hesitant. It's always um, being a little bit afraid. And that, 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 that attitude says, blessed are the persecuted. And he has to reinforce this by saying, hey, don't have a light and stick a bowl over it. You've got to let that thing shine so that everyone can see the message of Jesus and the hope of salvation. And he personalizes it in verse 16. He says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar over here, but uh, the word there for, for good is the, it's the word kalos. And it basically just means a term for beauty. Let them see the beauty. Not beauty in and of itself, but the beauty that comes. It's an attractiveness that comes from the word of God. And that's this message that we want to share. Let them see your beauty. Let them see the, the, the attractive, uh, let them see the quality and not just the good deeds themselves. And I'll just give a little footnote over here. It says, in the beginning of verse 16 there, he says, let your light shine. Let it shine. You, know, you don't have to light it. If you've been baptized into Christ, it's in you. You've got the light. You don't have to crank it up. You don't have to fan that flame. You, know, you don't have to do whatever to, to get it going. It's there. you just got to let it go. Um, your grandsons, George and Isaac, came out to Australia a few years ago. Uh, Frozen was the movie. Anyone remember Frozen? Uh, my two children and, and the old grandchildren, George and Isaac, were of the similar ages. And um, they met each other at the airport, just hit it off straight away. It was just wonderful. We got in the car. We started talking Australia and uh, America. They, and the, the kids were, didn't have a lot of things in common. They said, have you seen Frozen? Yeah, yeah, we've seen Frozen. Well, for the next, I don't know, two weeks, we were driving along, and my, my, my windows were wound down, and they were singing, let it go, let it go, don't hold back anymore, no, let it go, 
to let it go. And the whole two weeks I had let it go coming out of my ears. But you know what? Let's let it go. You are the light. Let it go. Let it shine. That's what Jesus is saying here. Don't hide it under a bowl. Don't put, it, don't put something on it. Just let it go. Um, you've got to let it shine. Let it shine before men that they may see your, your, see your, your good works. Um, and they're going to hate you. And they might kill you. And they might reject you. And they might deny you. But let it shine. Let them see the beauty of your works, your good works, and that message that you shine. Uh, I'm really passionate about Friends Speak in, in Australia. It's a, it's a wonderful program. Someone over here developed it. Missionaries had been using it over there. They came over here, used it over here. We use it in Australia, and it's just a wonderful way, wonderful tool to, to shine the light of Jesus. And people come along to me and I say, well, I'll be your friend. I'll help you with, you've got a need, you want to learn English, I'll help you with the English, I'll help you pronounce words, I'll help you spell words, um, I'll help you to speak, uh, not with a, with a kind of a South African, uh, Australian accent, but anyway, they'll, they'll pick that up. Uh, but we, they see, people come along and they see, well, you do this for us? And as Dale said, you're not going to charge us? Um, we'll do this because it's, it's a good work and we're sharing good news about Jesus with them. And they're just blown away by the fact that people will do this and they, they just respond to the gospel. And it's amazing. But you know what? When you hide your testimony, you're not doing anything but preventing someone from seeing the beauty of God. So let me encourage you. Let it shine. Let it shine. Well, last one. Here we go. The presupposition, uh, the plan, the problem. And we'll finish off with the purpose, and we'll do this very quickly. You know the purpose. Um, we'll just run through this very quickly, and we'll finish here. The purpose is the dignity of God. Uh, and that's at the end of verse 16. There's one single reason why you should be salt that is salty and light that is visible, and that is that they may see your good deeds and praise or glorify your Father who is in heaven. And if you don't do it, then you're more concerned about your reputation than you are about, than about his glory. So let it shine. Um, that's always the issue. Um, you might say, well, I, I don't know if I should stick my neck out. You know, I might lose my reputation. I might lose my job. I might lose whatever. Let me ask you a question. Can you lose yourself? Can you be salt that is salty? Can you... Be light that is visible. You can. If you only care about the glory of God. And that his praises. But if you let your own personality. And your own popularity. And your own prestige. And your own reputation. Get in the way of God's glory. Then everything is going to be dragged down. And, in, and you're, you reign. And you're the Lord. And you're the master of your own life. Wonderful thing, we'll just close with this. He says, glorify your Father who is in heaven. And he, 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 Jesus just uses this. He, he, he talks about God as our Father. And that, again, reminds us of um, the fact that God is personal. He is our Father. He is loving. He is kind. And then he says, glorify your Father who is in heaven. And that, again, speaks about his majesty. And so on the one hand, we have God as a father is loving and tender. And on the other hand, he's majestic and he's sovereign and he's our Lord and he's in heaven. And he says we are to glorify God. And that is the good news. And that's the reason. That's the reason why we do this. That's the reason why we're salt. That's the reason why we're light and why we influence. And that's all it is. It's all about God's glory. So here's our last question for us. What about you? What about me? Are you the kind of salt that stops the corruption and the decay? Because that's what he wants us to do. Are you the salt that stops that corruption and decay? Are you the light that attracts people to the, the beauty and the holiness and the, the, the message of Jesus? Are you shining? Are you doing those good works so that God can be glorified and people around you can be touched by this message? And you never cover it up. Don't, whatever you do, don't cover it up. 
let it shine. When I was a little boy, we learned that song. This little gospel light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You know, and I sang that song all my life, um, not really knowing what it always meant. You know, but when we start living the salt and being that salt and we're shining for Jesus, we can turn the world upside down. And more and more souls can be saved and God will be glorified. Thank you very much. And should your family come to Christ? Wonderful. Thank you, Kent. Um, my, my dad attended a gospel meeting held by Tex Williams. In, uh, he came out to South Africa. I wonder what uh, year that was, do you know? Uh, I, I don't know. Long before I was born. I was born in 66, <laughs> so it was sometime before that. Uh, my mum and dad had been Baptists and Methodists and things, and they heard this being baptised, and they said, oh, we've been baptised twice. We don't need to do this. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't listen to this guy. Um, but my uncles and aunts had been in the church, and a year later, Tex Williams came out again and probably felt like he didn't do very well because only two people responded to that gospel meeting. And it was my mum and dad who walked down the aisle, um, were baptised into Christ. Um, many years later, my dad was 45. He decided, well, I want to be the salt. I want to be the light. And he went and studied at the Southern Africa Bible College and became a, a preacher. And I've just grown up in a, in, a, in a Christian home. But it was, you know, it was because of brethren like yourselves over here who've gone to mission fields and being the salt and light there. And I'm, I'm, we are so blessed in Australia. Hartman family, the, the Ropers, and many of others of you who've come out there. And there's the Cassis, that's right, and the Powells. I mean, you guys have have blessed our lives abundantly. We are the churches in Australia, it's small. Uh, we're in a dark world. We're in a decaying world. Um, I, I look at other places and the, the gospel just spreads there like wildfire. It's really tough over there. But um, if it wasn't for folks like you, there would be no church in Australia. So the, the, the light is shining there. And it's shining bright. And I'm very thankful.